in university education. And their fellow um, researchers on this uh, study, uh, James Matthew and Carmel Hensley, can't be here today, a mixture of, of, of COVID and other commitments that have uh, impacted upon them, but they have been working very hard. And um, these four colleagues have been our teaching fellows and have done outstanding work on this kind of research. Uh, uh, since the time of their appointment and got very interrupted uh, by COVID and pivoted mm -hmm. extremely well because of COVID and benefited the university hugely in that regard. So I'm looking forward very much to what they have to say this afternoon. So hand it over to you, Emma and Bristol. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie and David, for that introduction. And thanks very much for the opportunity to present um, today. We're delighted to get a chance to present to the CSHE group. Um, we want to talk about fostering metacognition and university education. And just to set the scene, as uh, Marie alluded to, this st all started as um, the UCD Fellowship in Teaching and Academic Development. The overall aim of this was to explore how the move to a new VLE could be leveraged to support meaningful learning and the university education strategy with a particular focus on this from a pedagogical perspective. So it brought four of us together that didn't know each other from very different disciplines, which was fantastic. We all had a real interest in teaching and learning and were keen to, to proceed on this project. And we spent a bit of time deciding what really interested us and decided that actually, despite our disparate um, backgrounds, we all had really key core um, values that we wanted to explore. We wanted to, we felt that really the development of 21st century skills like knowledge application, critical thinking, and adaptability through lifelong learning were going to be fundamental for students as they um, during their um, time at university but also as they progress into professional life we wanted to really combat surface learning and students not linking com um, concepts which often happens with fragmented modular system if, if we're not careful and overall to promote student engagement and the theme that we thought we could really tie this together with was promoting metacognitive skills in students so I thought I'd give an overview of where we're heading with this talk using one of the figures out of one of the papers we're, we're working on at the moment. And what I want to do is think why metacognition? What evidence base are we looking at? Look at our framework design and how we've blended these um, approaches with technology. In the paper, we look at evaluation of our framework against um, a, a, an evaluation tool and look at supporting materials. Here, Crystal's going to present uh, our data, which is another paper looking at how we've evaluated our framework. And we'll show you some of the resources we've developed, which we think are, are exciting and where the project's heading now. So just so we're all on the same page, metacognition, we use Flavel's definition, an awareness and understanding of one's own thought processes. And usually this is considered broken down into two key components, knowledge of cognition, so about things, how and when to do them and why and when to do them, and then regulation of cognition, skills that help control learning like planning, monitoring and regulation. And Crystal will be coming back to that a little when we look at some of our data. Why did we choose metacognition? Well, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this really is linked to um, academic achievement, but also linked to effective critical thinking ability and fundamentally important to effective learning and the ability to self-regulate learning and re unlearn, relearn and adjust learning. It's something that's exactly being recognized as being fundamentally important for future professional life with the rapid change and a need for progression in, in that scenario these days. More importantly, there's evidence to suggest that met, with the right sorts of teaching and learning approaches, it is possible to help students grow metacognitive skills. And that's important if we were hoping to, to have some impact. And there's little done looking at that in the blended learning space, but what really excited us that with, with blended learning, you've got the opportunity to influence students over a far wider period of time, not just standard class times, but whenever they're logging in and by linking in with them, you can extend your, your period of influence. So that's really what interested us. 
where we wanted to start with a strong evidence base and we we looked at the literature but we also were really interested to find this very useful resource by the produced by the education endowment foundation which is a charitable trust in the uk that specializes in evidence summaries uh, centered around secondary level education. And they really had done a lot of work on metacognition and self-regulation because they felt there was extensive evidence to support this as a very high impact intervention that could be delivered at low cost. And they developed guidance documents around how to achieve this in secondary education and a series of key recommendations. Now we took five of their seven key recommendations that were most relevant to us at the time because others were around institutional buy-in and staff training and so weren't relevant and really have have run with these um these uh, metacognitive themes as we've called them so what they say what they demonstrated looking at the literature is that you need to explicitly teach students metacognitive strategies you need to model this thinking through the teaching approaches you take you need to set appropriate level challenges for students, so give them tasks that they can get their teeth into and really start working through and using these skills and honing their skills. All the time you need to be promoting and developing metacognitive dialogue, the student with themselves, the student with each other and you with the student and also explicitly teach students management and organisation of their own learning. So we had this evidence base, but we wanted to translate theory into practice and we're interested in work um, that Oliver and colleagues had done looking at learning design sequences that mapped out how to present learning materials online in a way that was accessible. What we liked was that they placed student activity central um, to achievement of the learning outcomes and then mapped out online the resources and supports available to help them support in this achievement. Now the next little graphic is taken from one of our videos and runs through at great speed but the reason I've included it is I think it gives you an idea where our framework came from which looks a bit busy if you're met with it straight up. So we took student activities and they were working towards learning outcomes. The main thing we did was get them working on a complex authentic project. So they were doing something tangible and real to them as the, uh, as the professional they were planning to become and looked at the sort of resources and supports that could help them achieve that and broke those down into four categories. So ones that introduced the approach, um, ones that signpost the students and how to achieve it, enabling resources, and then if it's resources that help them evaluate and self-regulate. So, and it was all color coded based on those metacognitive themes. So this then progressed progress to this, and it looks busy, but what I want you to take out of this is a few key things. First of all, we've got our metacognitive themes, and I think you can see by the splash of colour on the right hand diagram that we've, we've got those mapped throughout the learning interventions that we proposed. These resources and supports can be delivered online or face to face and using a graphic like this, you can start planning how you how you integrate those and truly blend rather than just putting things up in the online environment. <clears throat> so this shows our overarching metacognition design framework and this is really designed for use in a variety of settings and the idea is that you then develop a bespoke version for use in your own practice and what we've done is term that um, the metacognition design sequence but first of all i want to just show that we've got our ic strategies for learning just highlighted here showing which bits relate to the introducing signposting enabling and evaluating so this shows a metacognition design sequence that we developed for use in veterinary medicine, hence the, the, my dog making his way into in appearance just to prompt us that it's veterinary here. The vet students were working on this clinical module on a subject that they often find quite challenging. What we decided to do was set them on an authentic project, which was working as a vet to problem solve a case that presents to them in groups. And they had gradual disclosure cl clinical cases with all the materials, CTs, videos, MRIs, blood results. And they had checklists that helped them guide them through the process from start to finish. 
They then presented that in the form of an infographic highlighting what knowledge they needed and how it related to knowledge they'd gained in earlier years and presented that to lower years in the, in the vet school. So they really had to explain it because to teach is to learn twice. Um, and, and this approach was very successful. So what we became aware of as we'd done this um, is that there were really two parts to what we've termed the learning journey going forward. So we need to think about what the students facing and what we're needing to think about. Is, and what we've tried to do is develop ways of using this IC learning approach and our metacognition design framework to frame the, the learning journey from both the staff and student perspective to help people really effectively blend learning and use the advantages offered by that approach. I'd like you to just glance at the left-hand diagram, first of all, which is another one out of our paper, and it shows an overview of the, the sort of development of the, the framework. So we've looked at the, if, if we move to the right now, it's easier to see, and I've homed in on the first part, and Crystal will come back to this. We've looked at the evidence-based, based to this development, but the framework also aligns with well-recognized um, Sub, well recognized publications in this field. So the TPAC model says that when you're doing this sort of approach, you need to think about knowledge of technology, knowledge of pedagogy and knowledge of content, subject matter content. And we've done that with the framework. It also aligns very well with many aspects of Lorillard's conversational approach. And not only that, several landmark um, publications on good principles of good undergraduate education. So we feel that it has a strong grounding. So we've now developed the metacognition design free, um, framework and have a, a workplace in flow to, sh to show people how to develop their own metacognition design sequences and then how to set about aligning those with the appropriate technology. And I just want to show you snapshots of that because there's not time to go into any detail before Crystal shows you a little bit of our data. So when we're thinking about these metacognition design frequent, uh, sequences, the main thing we want people to bear in mind is think blended and think usage of the VLE to enhance exposure time, personalization of the student learning journey, and really impact them being able to think about their learning and being more actively involved rather than just passive consumers of knowledge. The other aspect is to think about managing your own workflow and ways that you can help with that. So this gives an, a, a, a graphic we've been using to help people look at progressing through the framework and think about the different steps. So establishing an effective complex project that might engage students in their own field and then progressing through the IC approach. The, the publication has a, a table uh, that looks at the sort of consideration of the sorts of learning requirements your students might have and the technology affordances that might be available both from a student and a staff perspective to help people start effectively ma mapping out um, the learning approach and effectively using technology rather than just adding it on because it's there, having a good grounding for why you're using things. So I want to hand over to Crystal to give a taster of some of our results, and then we'll come back to the exciting places the project's heading now. Thanks very much. Over to you, Crystal. Thanks, Emma. Um, and also thank you for having us here today. Uh, this is gr a great opportunity for us to talk about some of the things that we've uh, talked about before, but also to talk about some of that new and exciting stuff that we're doing. So first of all, uh, one of the things that we were delighted to find was that you know, we each we each took a, our module and we we implemented this metacognitive thinking, uh, a design for the students to follow through and and just to see did it have an impact on how they approached their learning. And so, as you can see here, we had positive results. We had uh, significant results in our statistical counts. Students had to do a survey, a metacognition standard survey. Uh, it's it's a, a survey used elsewhere. It's at the bottom there, the inventory. Um, they had to do that at the beginning of the module before they ever started. And then at the very end, after 12 weeks, to see how they had progressed. And, you know, the students, we sent the surveys back to the students so they could look at their learning as well. And then we talked to them uh, about their outcomes. So we were delighted to see that we had significance. And the other thing that's really important to note is that we had a medium uh, level 
of, of impact here, medium significance, which is incredible. We achieved in 12 weeks uh, what other studies have been working on and, and they spent an entire year doing. So we were really delighted with that part of the study. Um, and then we did some qualitative work as well and I'll leave to Emma to switch the slide. So we wanted to, to see how students were progressing. We talked to students, we had fo focus groups with students on different modules. And we asked them about their learning. We asked them about how they progressed and, and tried to dig further into uh, what we hoped they were learning, but we wanted to see if they recognized it as well. And we found, having looked at all of that data, we came up with uh, the four things that students could see themselves. And that was that introducing, that signposting, the enabling, and the evaluating, which was wonderful because these were all parts of metacognition that we wanted them to see. So just going through the different steps of our IC model, um, the first step is introducing. And so the idea is to give a clear structure and organization of learning and segments. So in veterinary, um, AMA uh, took segments as three week blocks of learning. Um, in the social sciences, uh, I was teaching a, a social a model on social media uh, called DigiLife, and I was taking segments as weekly segments. Uh, the key was to be clear about the structure and to make sure students understood those segments and, and that they existed and how they were aligned in, in Brightspace. Um, so there's that logical presentation. Students don't want to get lost in Brightspace. They find, if, if you think staff find a, a VLE confusing sometimes, <coughs> the students are trying to find content that they really want to find. And then they come back to you and say, oh my gosh, where do I find this? What is this? Uh, so we wanted to make sure that everything was presented logically, had a pathway, and things that encourage students. We wanted sort of markers that said to students, come on, go into this, this piece of learning, make this something, you know, if you, if you took the whole piece and tried to do it, you're gonna find this overwhelming. How about digestible blocks of learning? So encouraging them to say, yes, I could do this part, now I can tackle the next piece. And students came back with comments about this. So for instance, rather than focusing on absolutely everything, you're just finishing, one, focusing on one thing, learning it really well, and then moving on to the next. And so that was really important to students to have that progression through material. Second, signposting. We need, to, we need to put up the street signs. We need to make sure students know where they're going at all times. So we wanted to provide tools and content that provided guidance. Things like rubrics and exemplars are signposts that help keep students on track. And students recognize this, seeing the rubric was really helpful. So uh, one student commented that rubrics are really, really handy because you've got to learn a bit more, like you knew a bit more of what was actually being asked for. So they're always looking for that secret decoder ring to their learning and the signposting helped them get there. Enabling is the third step. And this is, this is looking at tools. So in Brightspace, you know, we use things like checklists, tools that can support students as they progress along, things that motivate them. Ticking off everything in that checklist is really satisfying. Um, and these things facilitate self-regulation of learning and they increase student confidence. So for instance, one student said uh, on the left there, the checklist was very self-motivating. You knew what you had to do. So no surprise is learning, right? They wanted to know. And then you literally just tick it off and it's kind of broken down into more manageable tasks. Definitely, it was very useful. So they really found these checklists were a highlight. We also had our final step, evaluating. Uh, these are checkpoints in learning. This is where students can pause and say, did I get it? So we wanted them to self-evaluate. We wanted them to check in on their learning. So we did things like peer feedback, um, video feedback, feedback from instructors. All of these things came into play. We used short quizzes throughout content, and we used reusable learning objects like these tutorials to help students take a snapshot of a piece of learning, really learn it well, and then they could move on. Um, and of the quizzes, students said that quizzes were a really nice way of testing your knowledge of the module without being worried about stressing out for tests and stuff. Really helpful in terms of self-directing your learning. So they're picking up on you know, their role as a learner. Um, and then, and I think the video reflections or the video feedback 
was really good because it meant that we had feedback on stuff that wasn't actually graded. I felt like I was act I actually knew what was expected from us from the module and from the feedback knew what I needed to do as well. Finally, we provided multiple opportunities for reflection throughout our modules. Uh, we wanted students to stop and pause and think about their learning at key points. And we felt that this was, you know, this is a good way to get them really deeply thinking. And this reflection did deepen learning by helping students evaluate and plan for future learning. And students noted this reflection was good for making you actually think about learning. It made you actually think about the points that I was thinking over rather than just blindly going through the points of the lecture. So there was a purpose, they had direction, and that was important. And the reflection supported that. So Emma talked to you about the first part of, of you know, our project overview. In now what we're doing, so we've, we've talked to you a bit about uh, the IC uh, approach, our metacognition design sequences. Uh, we map these onto appropriate VLE tools. So we've mentioned some of those checklists, et cetera. Um, and then we did trials as case studies. Uh, and so now, you know, we've, we've been working on exemplars, we're working on developing a community of practice uh, with metacognitive champions um, who are taking the, the model and implementing it in their own uh, module spaces. Um, and we have also uh, created, it's a little different as a publication, but we've also created a video uh, case study for the project and mini case videos. Um, so this, we're entering into, I think, a really exciting phase <laughs> of our work. So we have two papers in preparation that should be hitting an editor's desk any minute. Uh, one is on our design framework, and the second one is on that uh, putting everything into action and those results, those quantitative and qualitative results and digging into those a bit. Uh, and so hopefully that will be out soon. And we hope that these will provide, again, a flavor of exemplar that people can use to uh, take on this, this model in their own teaching practice. We've also, uh, as I said, there's that video. We've also got a short highlights video with it. It's available on the teaching and learning website if you want to watch it. Uh, the case study videos, those mini videos, we thought that this was a really good way to take a snapshot of each of our disciplines through one of our modules. Uh, and also we've recently uh, had a national forum supported seminar and we, we saved our video. And it includes a keynote with Professor Sandra McGuire, who's an expert on metacognition in the United States. So this forms part of our, our ongoing uh, look at metacognition, but also our outreach and dissemination to others. We also have um, Carmel uh, is currently finishing a fourth case study as part of our, it was part of the original fellowship project, but that is now coming to fruition. So that's exciting. We'll have another, uh, a fourth case study there. Um, we've also embarked on a pilot study, uh, fostering metacognition and university education. And this is where our metacognitive champions come in. We want people to adopt this. We don't want to hide hide our light under a bushel, as they say. We want for people to, to have this. We want this to be open access and we want people to take it and develop it and use it. And so at the moment we have in UCD, we have people in architecture, linear algebra, nutrition and postgraduate nursing who have implemented this in their modules. Um, we're also, and I'm going to hand over to Emma, uh, we are developing an international module um, in conjunction with D2L and the Bright Space Learning Center called Metacognitive Teaching and Learning Strategies. The idea of this, you know, is, is one, we can bring part of Sandra McGuire's work uh, to, to a further audience. And she, it's very exciting. We have a collaboration with her and she is freely letting us use some of her materials as well to support this. And it's also supported very kindly by D2L. So the idea of the space, and I will hand over to Emma, the idea of the space is to provide that place where people can become metacognition champions and train themselves, you know, train the trainer. So I'll hand over to, to Emma now. Thanks very much, Crystal. One thing we were always aware of, we've, we've presented our work um, several times. I know Marie's heard various iterations as this has, has grown. And it was always, uh, there was a lot of arm waving at various points that was, here's our model, 
and we do it and this is our trial and the bit in the middle was a bit lost in terms of trying to explain that process so that's what we hope will be helped with the paper that's planned that out but also the papers designed to link in with this learning resource and our videos to really enact things in practice so we want to invite educators to join us in this um, bright space learning module um, metacognitive teaching and learning strategies because they can actually try things out in practice because one of the one of the recommendations has always been and that was actually with the TPAC model that actually learning by design is very powerful so we're inviting people to learn by design and join this learning by design module which they can try out and learn try the approaches so I thought I'd show you just a few screenshots it's due to launch in the next few weeks um, and will be open internationally, as Crystal said. So it, it introduces um, learners to, to our project and helps uh, them join and de develop their own metacognition design sequences, working collaboratively in a community of learning. So this just gives you some snapshots of, of the content there, that they're welcome and learn a bit about um, metacognitive strategies, metacognition, designing for learning and the framework and putting it into action. It's designed to be interactive and it breaks it down into in step-by-step -step challenges for them to join us. But the really exciting thing um, is that we're hoping to data gather in this to actually use this as a way of informing how our framework's performing in terms of people using it and develop further resources. And, and as Crystal's also said, we hope to use this to train metacognitive champions to join us to develop um, further, further people utilizing this approach and develop further, further resources still. So this gives you an example of one of the pages where it, it takes a step-by-step -step th um, look through, provides examples that people can download and use, including the introductory slides here are from Sandra Maguire that she freely shares to allow people to adapt to their own setting introducing metacognitive strategies to students. So we've trialed this briefly as part of the um, National Forum Seminar. The module was open in, a, in an embryo, embryologic state um, for, a, for 10 days and had great, um, great number of people in, interact with it at that point. So we were delighted. So we're hoping that when we launch it properly, we're going to get great interaction from people. So what we're hoping to do is further grow this community of practice. When we roll out the module, as I say, we're hoping that this will allow us today to gather and disseminate more widely recruiting other people. But when we recruit the metacognition champions, we're hoping to use this as a mechanism to do a cross campus trial across a wider subject area, because what we hope is that this will allow generation of more little videos like we've generated and a suite of case studies that can all be open access, because we all know that something's much more tangible if we can relate it directly to our own practice. So vets copying mine will find that easier and probably going into medicine would be quite linked but it's always a little bit more challenging imagining it in your own subject area so we're hoping that with a suite of of these um, shared exemplars it will make it easier for people to adapt and we're working on looking at um, identifying sources of funding as well so we're delighted about this. We deliberately left it that we hope there's plenty of time for questions and discussion. I'm happy to show people around the module. I didn't want to do it live in the middle of the lecture because they say never appear with animals and children, but I'd add technology to that as well. Um, but it should be able to be shown live. No problem. It's not quite completed yet. Um, but thanks very much for listening and, and we'd love to have questions. <clears throat> Okay, Emma and Crystal, thank you so much for that. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, I have seen it from the very, very start and the way it has grown and developed. It's, uh, it's just really, really uh, amazing in terms of uh, what you've achieved and where you've taken it to. And the fact that, you know, you're willing to, to share with other people and build a community of practice, which is what all of this research and this work is about. So thank you very much for that. So 